Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I am the legendary Savak, but you already knew that. Or you didn't. Either way, doesn't matter. Uh, hopefully you didn't miss me. I was kind of on a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, it's hard to explain. I don't even know how long I've been gone. A couple weeks in there. I might disappear for another couple weeks. I don't know. I haven't figured that part out yet. But I'll let you know. Because when I know, you'll be the first to know. But I wanted to come back just prior to us going and, uh, well not going, they're coming down to us, but just prior to this game against the Jets, which looks on paper very winnable game. We should be able to just go ahead and knock them right on off and coast on out into the next week and keep this win streak alive. And hopefully we'll be able to do so. Although we will be without some things, some weapons, but I'm really not even here to talk about us all that much, which is the funny part. I remember that Colin Cowherd had made a comparison of Jets quarterback Zach Wilson uh, right after he was drafted. He compared him to none other than Johnny Football, if you guys remember that. Johnny, Johnny Manziel, that was a whole lot of fun. And uh, he was really just comparing him in play style, nothing to do with personality or off the field issues or any of that thing. If anything, uh, I've heard that Zach Wilson is quite the Boy Scout. I really wouldn't know. But uh, as far as play style goes, he is kind of similar. There are some similarities there. He does a lot of things that, that uh, you can look back at, at Johnny's film and see him doing some of the same shit. It's pretty interesting. Um, but. For whatever reason, that drew all kinds of ire out of Jets fans. Man, they were pissed about that. And uh, I had I just found that to be hysterical. But I did come across something really interesting. You see, uh, at, at the time that I had looked this up, uh, Zach Wilson had played nine games. And I was uh, looking, and turns out, in Johnny Manziel's second season, which was uh, 2015, uh, he also played in nine games, and so we had the same sample size from both of them. Now, admittedly, it's Johnny's sophomore year versus Zach's rookie year. However, Johnny wasn't the starter his rookie year, and uh, it's still Johnny Manziel. So how much pro mentality did he develop between years one and two, considering I think it was after that, after, uh, considering after that year, he was on his way out. Uh, so it was very interesting. I think that it's pretty fair to kind of compare the two. And if you put those two seasons side by side, Johnny Manziel's 2015 and Zach Wilson's 2021, they're eerily similar. And, actually, and, 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 and aside from one statistical category, which is just overall passing yardage, <laughs> Johnny actually looks a little better. <laughs> Uh, so if you go across both, again, nine games, they completed around the same amount, of, uh, around the same percent of passes, which is, uh, of course, Zach has thrown it more, but I think that's more an element of the offense that he's playing in uh, and factoring in that, that Johnny playing was a few years ago. Uh, Zach completed 56.1% of his passes. Johnny, 57.8%. Now, of course, like I said, Zach has the edge in terms of yardage with a little over 1,700, where Johnny has flat 1,500. Now, Zach has thrown, had thrown, because I, you know, I'm not factoring in anything else from, beyond the nine games, six touchdowns to 11 interceptions. Interestingly enough, Johnny had thrown seven touchdowns to five interceptions. And of course, everywhere else, Zach has been sacked way more, which is also interesting considering that, you know, Johnny was on a, on a significantly worse football team. The, the Browns at that point were nowhere near what the Browns are now. Uh, in fact, I was actually one of the few people that was a big fan of Johnny Manziel coming in, and I was one of the people who believed that he could actually be successful. If the man had gotten his mind right and had actually been mature enough for the situation, there is no reason he couldn't have been successful. Uh, now, while he didn't have any of the elite physical traits that we like to see in our quarterbacks, he did have an elite element to his game. It was that ability to thrive in chaos, that his ability to produce something out of nothing, to make something happen when shit is hitting the fan all around him. In fact, it was one of the things that made him a perfect fit for Cleveland. 
Cleveland, who literally had like one good player on their team, which was the Hall of Famer Joe Thomas at left tackle. Otherwise, the rest of that roster was trash. And you're throwing this kid in there to go and fix that? So, of course, he failed. However, uh, he was a perfect fit for that because of his ability. That was the Manziel magic. Now, admittedly, it was something he kind of, he had always been doing uh, his entire career up to that point, which is why uh, in college he played in uh, Cliff Kingsbury's air raid offense, and he didn't even really study his playbook. He didn't study before games, and uh, in fact, preferring to party. And then that's why he would go out there on the field on Saturdays and he'd dry, you know, snap the ball, drop back, and if his first read wasn't open or if it was getting a little muddy, he'd start running around. And because that, that was what he did. He, if it wasn't working within the structure of the system, he would introduce an element of chaos to it because he can thrive in chaos. And that's when you'd see him run around. He'd go right, go left, go right, up, down, this way, diagonal, jump, whip the ball down the field, touchdown. And then we'd see it on ESPN 30 times, you know? And uh, Zach Wilson has a little bit of that to, to his game, but he's a little more refined. However, he's not, he doesn't have the same kind of natural feel for that style of play that Johnny had. So it, it's interesting to see. Now, of course, like I said, I was a, I was a Manziel fan, and I, I was even one that, uh, believing that, that Miami should have brought him in because... Why the fuck not? You know, we, uh, especially after uh, Tanny went down that second time uh, in 2017, and we just had nothing at quarterback. You know, I figured, why not? Go for broke. You ain't going to pay him anything anyways. You're going you're gonna to spend pennies to bring him in. You might as well see if you can get some production out of him. You know, I, I had honestly, back then at that point, I said, hell, we should bring, if I were them, I'd bring in Manziel and Kaepernick. Have them compete for the for the starting job. Whoever wins, they're the starter. And the other one's the backup. What do you have to lose? You know, at that point. But uh, whatever. That's that's not even a story for well any time. I don't I don't feel like <laughs> expanding on that. But uh, I did find that to be very interesting. And then of course though uh, that side by side comparison, Johnny naturally was has more rushing yards because he was a, a more natural rusher. You know, he uh, his escapability was second to none. His And then, I think the, my favorite thing about watching him play was I don't believe I've ever seen a quarterback who was more accurate throwing on the move than that dude. Johnny Manziel, would, would, in all that running around, he'd be fleeing off to the side and whip the ball down the field, you know, and ridiculous ridiculous you know full speed and he'd throw the ball and put it right where it needed to be it was absurd so there of course the, the kid was remarkably talented you know and it, it was a shame that it ended the way it did but it was all his own doing so bummer however new york fans y'all gotta suck it up because that comp seems to hold up zach wilson is in so many metrics actually kind of a slightly less talented Johnny Menzel. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, I don't put this video out and then Zach Wilson just goes fucking bananas all over Miami. It's highly unlikely that he will. This is one of those moments where everybody loves to be right, okay? I love being right. I know you love being right. How can you not love being right? It's fantastic. And especially when you call it before it long before it happened. So I was taking a victory lap and I'll take another right now. Pat myself on the back. Way to go me. Because I said it. I was like, look, Zach Wilson appears to be talented enough to be able to get something accomplished. He seems talented enough to be successful in the NFL. But that first year is going to be rough. First couple of years might be rough and he is going to be turnover prone. That was what I said. And sure enough, the man can't stop. He loves turning the ball over. Uh, what was it? He threw five against the Patriots? That was just woo! Now I know <laughs> I know Belichick has that uh, reputation against rookie quarterbacks and young quarterbacks in general. He's really good at confusing them. But damn, dude. Five? Five. Huh. Yeah. So, should be a good game. I'm looking forward to it, especially after the bye week. My God, have I... I've never been so bored on a Sunday during football season. 
You know, n none of the games, I didn't feel like watching any of them. It didn't feel like there was any life to them. It didn't feel like there was a point, a purpose. I felt lost without my dolphins. And now they're back. Now, of course, we will be out. We will be without our top wideout. Uh, Jalen Waddle is landed on the COVID list. We actually just got two running backs back off of it. Miles Gaskin and Salvan Ahmed. So, woo! Oh, but we will be without Javon Holland, our star safety, star rookie safety. What a what a friggin' draft pick that was. Uh, I think if anyone wants to shit talk Chris Greer, you should go ahead and direct your attention to Javon Holland because that was at least one thing that was done done right. And regardless, we still have enough pieces to get this job done, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. And as long as two is on the field, I don't know if y'all have noticed, but uh, we've been winning games and when two is playing. So uh, I, I don't know. I don't understand what it is. Our fan base has become so toxic and confused. The fan base is so angry. What are you mad about? We're winning. We're winning the games. Why are you mad? What is there to be upset about? And this is why I cracked a joke about it, man. And people, uh, you know, people were split. And some people got it. And thank you for for those of y'all that did. Because, you know, and I, I, I said that Tua could lead the Dolphins to the Super Bowl and win. And there would be people on the other side arguing that he didn't hold the trophy high enough. And I still feel that way because uh, there, it is ridiculous the amount of scrutiny this kid has faced. But you know what? I understand where it comes from. It was all that hype, you know, hashtag tank for Tua and all that noise, you know. It was all this. Oh my God, he's such a such an incredible player. He's gonna be a generational talent. Oh wow. I mean, Fox produced a fucking documentary for this kid, and he hadn't even been drafted yet ridiculous you know how is anyone supposed to be successful under that much pressure you know then that much scrutiny because all of that only served to increase the size of the magnifying lens that was sitting over top of them and so now we've got to witness what the results of that were and um, either way though the kid has overcome I think he's earned his keep and I want to see what he can do now I do think that the backup position needs to be addressed because, uh, I'm sorry, I've never felt that Tua was the most durable player on the planet, and I still am concerned. So, I think having a good backup, and sorry, Jacoby Brissett is not a good backup, I think having a good backup is imperative. We need to do that. And, um, maybe not this year, but may and not this upcoming draft, but possibly the following one, We'll see a guy coming out who I've been talking about. I've been lauding as a great option if we can nab him. But it depends, I guess, on how this upcoming season goes for him. Uh, and that would be former UCF quarterback Dylan Gabriel, who is transferred to UCLA now. So this will be interesting to see him... <gasps> Mm. To see him running Chip Kelly's up-tempo offense should be a lot of fun. And if he ends up having a killer year, we might not be able to nab him. Because he will he might go a little earlier. But if we can get him, I think he'd make the ideal backup. Uh, aside from being almost Tua's clone in every conceivable way, uh, the kid is like Tua from Hawaii. He's a left-handed passer. I think they're the same freaking height. They're about the same weight. He's perfect, except the only injury really in on his uh, on his uh, on the books right now was one that was suffered this year was a broken collarbone, and in my opinion, is probably the reason he opted to enter the transfer portal because he's like, well, you know what, dude, fuck you, Gus Malzahn, I blame you for this, so I'm out, and I'm with it. Let's shift to this. <laughs> the Urban Meyer experiment comes to a close. Wow. Wow! I have to speak on it because I live in Jacksonville and this whole thing has been hilarious to watch from start to finish. It was it was like watching a, a, a train derailing in slow motion. You just can't look away. Uh, it, it, was, it was almost like watching the Hindenburg go down. Like, wow! Who would have thought that a coach with such a decorated resume coming out of college could just be so absolutely terrible? coaching in the pros and it's not even so much the coaching I mean obviously that left a lot to be desired but it was everything else around it because like these pundits on TV said said and I agree with them 
if not for all of those controversies, they probably would have let Urban Meyer stick around. At least for a season, maybe season and a half. They'd have let him finish out this year. They maybe would have given him half the year next year to get things really going. Because, you know, after you get about halfway through the following season and you're not making any fucking progress, that's a problem. And then they probably would have kicked his ass to the curb. But all of the controversy, how do you do that, man? I mean, how do you come in so incredibly ill-prepared? You. With that resume. You just, you come in and, and I don't know how much control he had over the draft, because obviously you get, they had to take Trevor Lawrence. There was no way they could not take him. How do you spend your other first round pick on a running back when you have a thousand yard back who is dirt cheap? You, you, you dra the guy was undrafted and he ran for over a thousand yards. <laughs> what are you doing, man? And I'm sure they just saw it as, oh, we want to bring in a versatile weapon that we can put to use all over the field and somebody who's familiar with Trevor Lawrence, and that's great. Except he would never even saw the fucking field. He got hurt early on, and that was, wow, that was great. You know, he, he, he had a season-ending injury. I don't remember, did it happen in, in training camp or preseason? Somebody? Doesn't matter. Either way, you draft a running back. Okay, all right, that's, uh... Interesting move, not what I would have did, but all right. Then you bring in Tim Tebow, and you're not even bullshitting about it. You don't even, you know, if and I agree with this sentiment. If they had brought him in, now I think that it was a, it was more of a culture move, which is funny because you come to realize since he went with the first wave of cuts, obviously it was a massive failure. It was never gonna work. I wish that he had been honest about it. Been hey. I'm bringing him in to try and establish, help establish this culture. I just need him as my guy in the locker room uh, to help bring them around. I'm going to have him listed as a quarterback. We're going to have him here. We're going to have some packages for him so we can maybe get him in the game, do some things. Because he's still, he's still very athletic. I think we can get a lot out of him. That would have been so much nicer than trying to bullshit everybody being like, Oh, we're going to make him a tight end. He's going to be great. Watch. Just watch. And then it was not great. Why? Because... Tebow's not a fucking tight end, but whatever. That went south. Then you had the, uh, the, 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 what was it? The strength and conditioning coach that was hired out of Iowa, who had previously been terminated from that job for making racial slurs at players. <laughs> and you're gonna bring him into Jacksonville? Oh, awesome, awesome. <laughs> No, and then you've got the thing where they, they, they get beat by by Cincinnati and Urban doesn't travel back with the team. And, you know, hearing when all of this has happened, all I can think to myself is, God damn it, Miami, we fucking lost to them? We lost to that? Come on, man. What a shame. And that, that, and that really was it, though. That was that was the beginning of the end right there. It's how are you not going to travel back with the team, first of all, after a heartbreaking loss? And then you're going to stay behind and let a video hit the internet of you getting grinded on by some sloot in a fucking bar? No offense to the sloot. I don't know who she is, and she's probably a very lovely woman. But come on, man! <laughs> oh, gosh. And then, of course, you know, it ultimately caught up to the story that came out just a couple days ago, which was Josh Lambeau alleging that Urban Meyer came over and kicked him at practice. How are you going to kick the kicker? I mean, damn, dude. You know, and it's amazing. I, gotta, I have to commend Josh Lambeau's um, self-control because I probably would have immediately dropped Urban Meyer or I would have let him know that if you touch me again I will drop you right here. <laughs> I will sink you in them little gator shoes you're wearing man don't tempt me. But uh, yeah that that was just a remarkable failure which of course leaves up in the air the question who will take over for him and there are some interesting names that are coming across you know obviously the the top ones that, that get out there you've got um, Eric Bieniemy. Because you, you feel like they gotta go, they have to go offense on this one. They have to get an offensive-minded guy. And the reason I say that is because they had back-to-back defensive-minded guys. That didn't work. Then you pulled a guy from college. 
that didn't work. So you got to get an NFL guy with NFL experience with an offensive mind. So that, of course, narrows it down. You've got a handful of people that rise to the top. You're thinking Eric Bieniemy be a great choice, probably, except, you know, we've been watching the Chiefs all season long, and they haven't been the same, you know? Something's been wrong with them, but we can't quite seem to figure out what it is. Uh, another name that hasn't been said as much, but probably will be floated around a few times, Kellen Moore, from Dallas Cowboys, and as much as I would love to see him leave, because, let's face it, man, that offense, that offense is, is great because of him. So if Kellen Moore leaves, I would love to see uh, Mike McCarthy try and salvage that situation. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of faith in Mike McCarthy's ability to do so. It's the same reason he was relieved of his duties in Green Bay, you know. But finally, it takes us to this one, Byron Leftwich, which feels like a fairy tale answer. Byron Leftwich, because if you're not familiar with him, Byron Leftwich was actually a quarterback who was drafted into the NFL in the first round by the Jaguars. Now, while he didn't have the career he was hoping to have, and left a lot on the field, he left a lot to be desired, it just seems so poetic for him to come back as the head coach and return this team to prominence. And what they need right now is somebody who understands what it's like, somebody who understands the market, understands the fan base, somebody who knows what it's like to be a rookie quarterback. And specifically a rookie quarterback in Jacksonville. It's just too perfect for words. And I know that obviously you can't give all the credit of Tampa Bay's offense to Byron Leftwich, but you have to admit he's doing a pretty good job. I mean, Jameis Winston was balling in that offense albeit turning the ball over, but that was a Jameis problem, not a Byron Leftwich problem. Then, of course, he's been coaching Tom Brady, and imagine the things that he's learned from Tom Brady that he could now impart onto Trevor Lawrence, you know? Because at this point now, Urban Meyer took what was a generational prospect and, turn and made him regress to a point that he's never been at before at any point in his career. So that's what they need. They need somebody who really understands what it's like to be where he's at. And uh, he needs somebody who's got a commanding presence, somebody who's able to talk to these guys like they are, you know, man to man. Like they're human beings, like they're adults with, you know, jobs and mortgages and things to care about, responsibilities. Somebody who can meet them at their level, not somebody who thinks that they're above them. And I believe that Byron Leftwich is that guy. So uh, I'd be willing to hedge my bet for Byron Leftwich getting that job. But of course, that remains to be seen. So either way, I don't know what the money line is, and I'm not a gambler, so I couldn't tell you. But I'm looking forward to seeing Miami play the Jets, and I believe we are going to win. And of course, by the way, mark your calendars, ladies and gentlemen. I will be at Miami's final game of the season, which will be when the Patriots come down to see us. I will be rocking that there jersey, the white one there, in honor of my fallen brother and co-host, the man, the myth, the mustache, my co-host from No Coast, Mr. Brian Byrne, the man from whom I have picked up the torch of doing the dad joke of the day. And uh, I would just be so incredibly honored if you guys would come find me, shake my hand, sign the jersey in his honor, and you'll probably meet his family because I'm going to be there with them, some of his sisters, nephews, uh, his mom might be there. I haven't been given that whole list of people, but <laughs> I will be among his family and I'm sure they would love to know the kind of impact that, um, that he had on your lives too. So come seek us out. Reach out to me on Twitter at Seriously Savak. Tune in, of course, during the week for the dad joke of the day. And uh, remember to like, subscribe, and ding the bell for the algorithm or else this will end up in YouTube hell and nobody will ever know that it existed. So thanks again. I love you all. I will see you soon. <laughs> I'll see you guys next time.